Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Miss Cook's Read Aloud. Happy Friday. It's Friday. I know you all deserve the weekend that's coming up. You all have been working so hard on your schoolwork at home. Thanks to the parents and families who are helping with that. We appreciate you. All right, we are reading With the Might of Angels by Andrea Davis Pinkney. And I do have permission from Scholastics to read this with all of you. Last time we were here, yesterday, we left off on Sunday, December 5th, 1954 diary book. All right, I hope you're nice and cozy, because I am. All right, I woke up this morning to the promise of winter. We don't get lots of snow in Virginia, but when snow covers all the houses and trees and spreads a quilt thick enough for making snow angels, I'm the first one to sing about jingle bells. Yolanda came over after church today, bringing gingerbread baked by her ma. We made up a song about the snow and sang it together. Fluffy silver, stuff, stuff, stuff. Make a ball of puff, puff, puff. Will it be enough, enough, enough? Yolanda and I giggled and giggled. She saw for real that I am not uppity. Now remember, since Donnie has been going to Pretty Men, all of her friends from Bathroom think she's uppity because now she's going to an all white school. But I guess her friends found out that's not the case. All right, Monday, December 6, 1954, diary book. The milkman came today early before the sun like always. He left the six glass bottles of milk in our tin collection box on the porch. Oh, did I want some milk with my oatmeal? At cafeteria time, I was tempted to drink from the Sutter's milk carton that comes on our lunch trays. Miss Billy delivered me from the temptation by not putting the milk on my tray. She also left off the pudding and gave me a burger without cheese. If I didn't think the kids at Pretty Men would ridicule me, I'd have brought my lunch in the peach melba pail with the bow on top. Later, ever since the boycott started, our phone has been ringing more than before. When mama answers, no one speaks. Tonight, eight calls came with silence on the other end. Now, if you remember, all of the Negro community decided that they're going to boycott Sutter's Dairy. And the reason they're doing this is because Donnie's father worked for Sutter's Dairy and was fired because Donnie started going to an all white school. And the white community, they do not want integration in the schools. So, which also makes sense why they're getting all of these phone calls with people hanging up. Tuesday, December 7th, 1954, diary book. Here is my Christmas list. It's called Donnie Wants. One, Donnie wants a new pogo stick. Two, Donnie wants daddy to get a new job. Three, Donnie wants a glass of milk and some mac and cheese. And four, Donnie wants to be a bell ringer. And here's the rest of Donnie's list for my eyes only. Five, Donnie wants to kick Bobby Hatch in the teeth. Six, Donnie wants Mrs. Elmer to slip on a wet floor and break her collarbone. Ouch. Seven, Donnie wants Teresa Ludlow to wake up with warts. Thursday, December 9th, 1954, diary book. Back came the milkman to take the bottles from Monday and to deliver new milk. It was so cold outside that the milk probably didn't spoil. Still, the man in the Sutter's truck set out six bottles of fresh temptation. Is it ever hard to not drink that milk? Friday, December 10th, 1954, diary book. The telephone has been ringing all evening. Only three of those calls have been from people we know. The rest were hangups. We only have one phone. It's on the wall next to our refrigerator with all the ringing. Our phone seems to be jangling the whole house. I can tell by the way mama's snapping for us to keep out of her kitchen and to fold the laundry faster and to do our homework and to get ready for church on Sunday that she's agitated. Goober's getting on mama's nerves. I just know it. He's annoying me too, walking in fast circles, pretending to answer a telephone, repeating, hello, hello, hello. Finally, this evening, mama took the phone off the hook. I don't blame her. So that we could eat supper in peace, but Goober wouldn't let up. 
hello, hello, hello. Except for saying grace, we ate with hardly any word between us. Goober, Goober kept on, hello, hello, hello. Finally, I couldn't take any more. I yelled at Goomer almost near to cursing. Goomer, shut the heck up. Saturday, December 11th, 1954, diary book. Mama and I went to the post office in town today to mail Christmas packages to my Aunt Karen, Mama's sister in Tennessee. We ran into Miss Nora, Roger's loud mother. Mama was cordial. Happy holidays, Nora, she said. Miss Nora was not feeling the joy of the season. It's hard to be happy when you can't use cream to make eggnog, she huffed. Try canned milk, Mama suggested. Try sending Donnie back to Bethune, Miss Nora huffed. Mama was working hard to stay nice. Nora, it's too late for that now. Besides, nobody's making you boycott Sutter's. Miss Nora held tight to her parcels. My boy Roger has twisted my arm. I'm just glad we've kept him at Bethune. You're court in trouble, Loretta, Miss Nora said. I would not want to be standing in your shoes now. Believe what you believe, said Mama. I believe my shoes are walking in the right direction. I couldn't help but turn my eyes to what Miss Nora was wearing on her feet. She had her nerve. Those were the ugliest shoes ever. They looked like warty toads with shoelaces. I would not want to be walking in them. Sunday, December 12th, 1954, diary book. Who put Miss Nora on hospitality duty at our church's front door? Seems she'd invited one of, one of her friends to join in putting me down. Miss Laura, a lady from our church sewing circle, stood next to Miss Nora as we filed into the em entry at Shepherd's Way. This must be the season for ugly feet. Miss Laura's shoes were as black as my Vaseline, but no kind of shiny. She must have picked them up from the giveaway pile on the Wicked Witch's front curb. Mama nodded to both women. Ladies, good morning. Miss Laura greet Miss Laura's greeting was as sharp as her shoes. Well, hello to the two good for the rest of us Johnsons. Not that again. Reverend Coolier started service by asking everyone who was participating in the Sutter's boycott to raise their hand. Some hands went up right away. Many stayed down, but after a moment, all hands were raised, all of them. Roger had both hands raised. That made me want to raise both my hands, so I did. Monday, December 13th, 1954, diary book. Today, we were sent home with two flyers from school, one announcing something called the Bell Bake Sale, the other reminding students about final tests for the semester. The Bell Bake Sale is to raise money for a new bell that will be stationed outside the school building on the front lawn. The flyer showed a drawing of the bell. That is a big bell. It's housed in a brick well and swings from an iron hinge. The handle from ringing the bell is as big as the grip on a butter churn. Just by looking, I can tell that bell rings loud enough to slice the clouds. I reminded Mama about my miserable eraser job and about the bell ringer job I really wanted. As soon as she read the flyer, she put on her apron. I'll start baking, you start studying, she said. Soon our kitchen table was covered with sugar, bowls, textbooks, tablets, flashcards, and flour. I asked, how are we gonna make sugar cookies with no butter or milk? Canned milk and Crisco oil, Mama said. Can Crisco sugar cookies, that sounded yuckier than yucky. If one person bought one of my cookies, I'd be lucky. But mama, but nothing Donnie, let's get started. Mama wasted no time. She mixed the ingredients, kneaded cookie dough. I memorized state capitals, then we switched. I got busy with the rhythm of our rolling pin and mama worked with me on algorithms. We baked enough cookies to feed all of Hadley. We let the math facts flow. We sprinkled and studied and tasted and tested. The canned Crisco cookie, sugar cookies were sweet and good. As I write this, I'm exhausted, but ready for the bell bake sale and any bonus test questions thrown my way on semester finals. And I'm ready for that bell, that big, beautiful bell. Tuesday, December 12th, 1954, diary book. One of the great things about a bake sale is that nobody knows who's baked what. 
my canned Crisco's sugar cookies stood among all the baked goods for the Bell Bake Sale. I didn't tell a soul that those glittery cookies came from Mama's kitchen. If I haven't learned anything else at Pretty Men, I've learned that the kids at that school would do whatever they can to undercut me. I watched with silent satisfaction as those cookies sold. Since Mama and I had made so many, and since they were the tastiest cookies ever, they earned the most money for our school. It made giving up milk and butter worth it. By end of the term, test went well too. I whipped through state capitals, fractions, easy. Word problems, no problem. Mr. Lloyd, our principal, announced the successful sale of so many sugar cookies and told the whole school the bell was on order and would arrive by spring. I came home with an empty cookie tray and a mind filled with knowing my stuff. Wednesday, December 15, 1954. Counting, a poem by Donnie. Counting days till Christmas, counting days till spring. Counting days till Donnie Ray gets a new bell to ring. Ooh, catchy. Thursday, December 16th, 1954, diary book. Today's erasers spewed enough chalk dust to coat my tongue. Thank goodness Mama kept some of our cookies at home for all of us to enjoy. I licked the red and green sugar crystals off two cookies. It was their sweetness that let me taste how unfair the bake sale was. My cookies had earned the most money to help buy the school's new bell, but I can't ring the bell. P.S. I haven't seen Waddle for some time now. Daddy told me that raccoons don't truly hibernate in winter, but they do sleep more and only come out a little bit in cold weather. I wish I was a raccoon. Friday, December 17th, 1954. Oh, diary book. I'm writing so fast and shaking and my head hurts. I can hardly believe today. Goober came to Pretty Men to meet me at, after school. He'd come on his own. Another one of his surprises. I was leaving out the back way, which cuts to the street quicker. I spotted Goober far off at the place where Pretty Men's playing field ends and the railroad track begins. I could hardly believe what I was seeing. Goober was a waving with both arms. His, he had my pogo stick in one of his hands, waving that too. He jumped onto the pogo's pedals, pumping, then falling off and trying again. From where he was, I could hear the squeak of the pogo stick, rickety spring. He called out to me, look Donnie, look at me. I can pogo even when there's a whole mess of snow. I raced to him, Goober, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to come out past our fence without first asking mama or daddy or me, not ever. And you're not wearing a hat or mittens. I was super angry at Goober, but I worked hard not to show it. He cries when I yell at him. The last thing I needed was for Goober to cry. I yanked him off school property as fast as I could. I have to wonder, are we wearing some kind of magnet that pulls the Hatch Brothers to us? Uh-oh. We were two blocks past Weedle Lane, and there they were again, the three of them, Bobby, Cecile, and Jed. I can't even write all what they said. I don't want to remember it, so I won't put it on paper. But I will tell you this, only because if I don't, I will break open from holding on to today as an ugly memory. The Hatch brothers threw Goober down into the snow. Bobby punched Goober twice, once in the stomach, then once in the nose until it started bleeding. Then all three boys ran off. The wet on my face from crying was stinging my skin and making a frosty film from the wintry air. I sniffed once hard. I didn't want Goober to see me really crying. I held Goober up. He was yelping from the pain and rubbing at his nose. I pressed my scarf to the place where his bloody nose still dripped. Mama was right about Goober. He sees the world in his own way. I tried to encourage Goober to put his head back to stop the bleeding, but he was too fascinated with the snow. Look, Donnie, look, do you see it? See what, Goob? I said softly. It's pretty, Donnie. It's red like a flower, like a rose with white all around it. It's so bright and all the white, white. Yes, Goober, I see it. I couldn't keep from crying no matter how hard I tried later. Mama gently rubbed medicine on the inside of Goober's nose and on the outside place where Bobby Hatch had punched him. Goober let out a tiny moan. 
He flinched and was silent. Daddy held me while we watched Mama dab Witch Hazel. That night, I did some punching of my own. It started with my baseball mitt. I rammed my mitt onto my left hand, then punched into its fold hard with my right. Bam, bam, bam. Something slammed at me right then, cause the punching grew to an all out attack with my fist. I couldn't stop. Bam, bam, bam. My punching hand got redder and redder and started to hurt me bad, but the bam, bam, bam kept coming. Both my hands were shaking with a, a rage. Soon all of my, all of me shook. I rope both my arms tight around myself, a throb pulsed into both my fists till I fell asleep on top of my bed covers. All right, we're gonna stop there until next time, which will be Monday. So it makes sense why Donnie was so frustrated that she wanted to punch her mitt. I think it's really hurtful when somebody you care about gets hurt like, like Goober did and just because of the way they looked and the color of their skin. So I will see you back here Monday. I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you for listening and toodles.